Happy Halloween, I inspired Columbine. I'm kidding. <laughs> Happy Halloween, folks. It's uh, the, the spooky episode of Overtly Critical. As you yes. can see, we are both in costume. What's your costume? I got new glasses. Oh, <laughs> yeah, me that, too. Yeah, fuck you, stealing my style. Okay. Absolutely not. I am from a previous episode of this show from season one. But this is season three, mm-hmm. episode four, in which we talked about what movie? We talked about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, directed by Toby Hooper. Or Tobe. <laughs> it's a very interesting way to spell the name, I'm just saying. Not the guy that made the movie Cats. Oh, no. <laughs> That's another Hooper, I believe. I don't know. Is that more of a horror movie than this one? I have not seen it. I don't know. That might be an episode in the next You season. haven't seen Cats? <laughs> anyway, Corwin, I guess you can start us off because we both came into this movie blind. Mm-hmm. So uh, what were your thoughts on Texas Chainsaw? Well, this was technically my pick on the poll that we did because I had never seen it, and I haven't seen a lot of slasher films, and I've heard that this is, you know, the granddaddy of the slasher movie. We're not counting Psycho. That's kind of a precursor. Anyways, I'd always heard this was like, you know, a really atmospheric, violent film, and it was one of the scariest films ever made. And that wasn't exactly my reaction upon seeing it. I mean, there's very little gore in the movie, but I think that's more to do with the budget and less to do with um, the intent. I'm sure if they had the budget, this would have been a gore fest. Yeah. And it's a solid piece of filmmaking. It's very clear to me how a film like this was able to inspire decades of slasher films. You know, it's got a legacy of Friday the 13th, Friday the 13th 2, Friday the 13th 3, all the other sequels, Halloween, Halloween 2, Halloween 3, you know what I'm saying. Halloween 2018. Exactly. Um, And, you know, it is good, especially for the length. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Yeah. Um, Yeah, Texas Chainsaw is kind of like the perfect horror movie for its time, the 70s. The 70s was a pretty gritty time period for films, and I think the aesthetic of this movie fits that perfectly. Um, It's kind of, and again, I'm not the most well-versed in horror, so I might be saying ignorant things, but trying to think of the time period, it was kind of, it feels like uh, horror took like a modern step, especially around this time period. I know Night of the Living Dead was a thing, but again, that's more zombie, so it's not exactly the same. Um, But it's almost kind of like the new generation of horror. There's actually a moment in this movie where they joke about calling the Hitchhiker Dracula, and I thought that was kind of funny. That's just a dumb little detail. But I don't really think the the low budget limits it in any way that lessens the impact of the film, really. I mean, having a bigger budget could have helped certain things. But uh, all in all, even the production design of this movie, despite their budget, they put a lot of effort into that. And I think that really helps it along. Um, so along with that and the pacing of this film, it doesn't really have any slow parts. I think it, um, it's a contained story, but they still put enough effort into it for it to be, you know, imaginative despite the budget. It's a good takeaway, good introduction. Yeah, so the film is a very, it's a very simple concept. It's, a, I don't, I feel like it would be mean to call them hippies, but yeah, it's the 70s. It's a, a group of 20 young somethings in a van. They're on some kind of road trippy vacation thing, and they go into this small Texas town. Um, although I don't know if it's very vacation-y because, as a character says, a family member works there. Um, but, you know, they get chased down by a chainsaw killer. Yeah, that's, essentially. That's I mean, the film. That's or, basically what happened. I think he yeah. had a mallet at a couple points. He did. He had but, a uh, big big sledgehammer. He just goes uh, bonk. I want to bring something up very uh, up front. So the film has an opening crawl, which is, you know, as we would kind of discussed before with, like, sci-fi films and how it makes a lot of sense there, I think for this movie, it's it's a, the following is a, it seems kind of redundant, but I do think in a way, um, the first time I watched it, I was like, I think this is a way for them to make it feel like not pseudo documentary, but almost putting that there makes it feel a little more real. Um, and then as as me and my girlfriend researched, um, my girl, I don't want to say Emmeline because I don't know if the audience knows Emmeline. She's been in Funny Notes before. We just said it. Anyway, um, I guess this is loosely based on a murder in Wisconsin or a couple murders in Wisconsin. So maybe they were trying to pull in that, like, sort of real aspect to it. But I, don't know. I think the uh, what the opening text crawl establishes is it gives us more information than the main characters. It's, it gives us the idea that we know most, if not all of them, are going to die. It's, they're going to die horribly. 
and this is not going to be, you know, a fun story. And then we get that fantastic opening montage with the music and the narration and the, like, it looks like a, uh, a crime scene photo of, like, dead bodies. And then that just absolutely chilling shot of, like, the human effigy put up on the grave yeah. site. It, it's not only atmospheric, but it lets the audience know how bad things are going to be. And we're screaming at the main characters throughout the first act of this movie and have been to act two just like, what the fuck are you doing? You guys are so screwed. In that intro, I really liked the... Um there was like an over, um, oh my god, if I flip this, John Easton can kill me. There was an overly long J cut in the beginning of like all of those sound effects from like like that, that like little quick photo kind of scene of all the body parts. We just get like at least 10 or 15 seconds of just black screen and you just hear all the noises. And I think that was, that was really, uh, that was another atmospheric thing as well. Um, and I guess with that shot and then after that we can kind of move on. Um, I really liked how that shot and the last shot of the film kind of have the same color tone. It's this very orange. It almost feels like hell. It's super, super orange. Um, there's a lot of, like, red in the film, too, but I really like that. It felt not just hot, but it felt – because a lot of times mm. people use color temperature to make things, like, feel hot or cold. In this case, it really felt like hell. Yeah, I can see that. To me, the orange-yellow tone uh, conveys this feeling of – not only overwhelming, sweltering heat, because, you know, we're in Texas in the height of summer, but also the sickly feeling, like, you know, rotting meat almost. Blood. I really enjoy the, the color throughout this movie. And it is kind of a gradual change. It doesn't start off one color. The beginning of the film is actually somewhat colorful, especially certain shots. Like, I think that one shot of the generator where the generator is bright red, the sky right. is bright blue, the, gr the grass is very green. But once Leatherface shows up and starts uh, bonking people and uh, hooking people and all that fun stuff, um, that's when the color of the movie really starts to turn into that surreal color. Well, at that point, it, the only times we, we really only see, like, sunrise, sunset, and nighttime, basically. Mm -hmm. So you just get these really... Um, washes of color. Um, I would like to point something out because this is a, I say a genre inventing film, but uh, that's kind of what we're talking about, is that compared to Natural Born Killers, because I would like to bring this Ooh. up, they have a shot of a dead animal on the road. And it's like, I've seen, and I said this, uh, the same thing with like the whole meat and murder thing in the last couple of movies, but that's like another thing, because like Natural Born Killer starts with like a dead deer. I think it was like an armadillo or something. It was an one. armadillo, yeah. But it's just, it's really interesting to see like, that's probably where that started, because like this whole film about animals and humans and killing, and it's like, oh, it's a dead, it's a dead corpse of an animal on the road, and it's like, it's just interesting that that one shot has been repeated so many times. Um, I guess it just says a lot about kind of the theme of the film, but it's just an interesting little observation. You know, I hadn't thought about it until now. Um, the first, sh the first like clear shot we get of the movie is the human effigy, and then after the credits, the first shot we get is of the armadillo. It's two dead animals, True. pretty much. Just one of those animals is us, because you know the whole story is framed by the idea of a meat, uh, not meat packing plant, a slaughterhouse and specifically a family that has been displaced by um, the slaughterhouse firing them by employing a more humane method, actually. So this family is the Sawyers, good old Leatherface, his brother, his dad, and their... Gramps. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. They resort to what they know, which is murder. But they're honestly, like, their most readily available prey are people. So they just, um, it's not something they really are doing because they're, you know, naturally bloodthirsty cannibals, yeah. I like to think. Because the dad is very much like, oh, I don't take pleasure in killing. Sometimes it's just something you have to do. Right. I, I really like that. About, not, not that I think this film was really trying to say something about, like, it wasn't making a grand point about, like, displaced workers and things like that. But I like that they put that effort into the backstory because it makes a lot more sense. Like, I know a lot of these slasher movies, it... it you could kind of, I feel like you could just take it for granted. Oh, it's just some crazy guy that's killing people. At least they made an effort to explain the family in this, which I really like that. And I don't, I don't think there's too much to say other than just saying this. I really wish, 
after they had this slight little, like, vegan conversation in the film about, like, eating meat, I wish that, like, slasher movies would take that theme. Uh, I wish they would emphasize that more because I feel like that's such a interesting... I feel like it's, like, the logical conclusion of the human meat comparison Um, because not just killing but the fact that we are eating because I forget the characters. I can't remember any of their names except Sally and... Frank, Frank Sally, Frank. Franklin, Daphne, Scooby. Yeah. You know, the mystery gang. The horoscope girl was, I think it was her, he was like, you know, don't talk about that. I like me. Or, no, no, no. Sally said that. And that mm-hmm. girl was like, well, it doesn't <clears> matter. <throat> Just not talking about it doesn't change the, doesn't change that it still happens. And I was like, I feel like if they, if they made some kind of like, and I'm, this is coming from someone that's a meat eater and I'm not even a vegan, I think that will be a really interesting, uh, you know, thematic approach to these movies that they should lean into more. I just thought that would have made this movie a lot more interesting. Let's just call what is the meat industry is fucking disgusting. It's, yeah, it's it, it, it is one of the most disgusting, corrupt, inhumane industries on the planet. And this mm-hmm. is coming from someone who ate bacon this right. morning. Not to mention they hurt the environment and farmers, but yeah, that's aside. Um, <laughs> I think my my single favorite aesthetic choice in this movie is. In the Sawyer's house, it is just their walls are covered with animal hides and skulls when they first enter. And then after, um, I think it's Kurt or Kirk gets whacked, which another great moment of him just sputtering like a dead animal. Uh, a horoscope girl goes in and falls. And that's when we see it's not just animal bones here. It's human bones. Right. And I like it not only from the perspective of it establishes that the Sawyers are not targeting humans specifically. They just see humans as another food source, as another resource, basically, because they use their bones to make furniture and their skin to make furniture. I mean, Leatherface's skin is a human face. They, they see them as indistinguishable from animals. Right. But also, I like that the characters don't aren't scared by the dead bodies of animals. But as soon as they see people, that's terrifying. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to get into too much of, like, this idea of, like, it makes you think, don't it? But it kind it of does. does make you think about, like, how we do see ourselves as separate from the animal world. But we're, we're willing to do these inhumane things to animals, or rather things that we would consider inhumane if done to a human, like putting them on meat hooks, right. bashing their head with a hammer. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's like uh, our, their family is the Sawyers. Yeah. It's... Uh, you, one thing you can say about them is they're not hypocritical. Although, you know, the film, like you said, it makes that point that it's like we have a moral, we're morally appalled to like seeing human remains and things like that. But it's the point of the film, or not the point of the film, but the film is saying like they're just doing what they do. Um, but as far as like the, like the plot of this movie is concerned, it's basically, it's such a, and I guess we can get to this about like what you said about like overexposed stuff because I, I kind of want to make this a big circle the film feels so like small and contained and like um the characters especially after seeing it once it's really a big trap because the only things they encounter um besides the, the cemetery but that was on purpose i guess the gas station was too but they encounter a hitchhiker and then they encounter then they go to a gas station where they see a, a barbecue guy a guy that owns it and then they go to the house and they see leatherface and it's like when I'm watching the film for the first time, I did not expect all three of those things to be connected. I don't know why. Um, like I, at first, I was like, "Oh, they're trying to tease you and make you think the hitchhiker is going to be the crazy guy, the murderer," but he's not. Um, but in a way, he is connected to it. I like that they're setting you up for the reveal at the end that the gas station owner was a member of the family the whole time. Yeah. Because when we're in like the graveyard we see like this crazy drunk guy and we're not sure who to trust. And then the hitchhiker, we're like, what the fuck? These people are crazy. Who knows what's going to happen to them? And I honestly was not sure whether that guy, the, the, the gas station guy, the dad of the Sora family was going to be, you know, a bad guy or not. Yeah. I had no idea until he pulls out the bag. I'm like, Oh fuck. Remember you had said when we were watching it, you Really like that Leatherface is scared of his dad. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a couple. There's not just that humanizing moment too. There's like two others that I really liked. Uh, obviously, his dad like walking around like Leatherface is this like scary, horrifying looking guy, and this just like little skinny old guys beating him with a broom. He's like, Ooh! but I really like two two moments. I think it was after that girl came, 
or it might have been it might have been the third guy with glasses. He killed him, and then he runs and he sits by his window and he's like stressed out and he's like, because you get the assumption that like people just don't come to the house. Um, but then also another moment in the film is when he's chasing Sally at the end. When he finally breaks through the door and he sees her, he's almost like startled himself. And I, I really like, they're like such little details, but I really like that. He, it is such a good performance on the part of the actor playing Leatherface. Um, but also the aesthetic design of him with the, the apron and the just ordinary clothes that he, he really, he looks like this is just his job. He's not some guy in rags or anything. He, he dresses up nice for dinner. He's got like a mask with right. like lipstick on that he puts on with a suit and a tie. Um, he really doesn't see himself as the monster that other people do. Um, I also love just the way that he screams like an animal. It's another great, you know, connection um, reinforcing the theme of the movie. Let's specifically talk about Leatherface and like killing. I really thought it was interesting that there was so, such little blood in this movie. Um, especially because like, even from a budgetary standpoint, like, I feel like it's not that hard to like spray blood. And it's just, I f and we obviously saw it happen when he killed Franklin. So like, I was always wondering in the, the, when the first two characters were caught and he was cutting, I was like, I was wondering, it, it must have been a conscious choice, I guess, not to show that much blood. And I, I think it's one of those things where like future films in the genre almost exaggerated that fact from this movie. Uh, this is this is going to get into a bit of a macro point, but it's almost not like a Mandela effect thing, but it's similar to like um, making up the fact that uh, Lecter said hello, Clarice. He did not say that in that movie, but it's people's recollection of it. So maybe people are like, oh, yeah, that super bloody, violent Texas mm -hmm. Chainsaw movie. We're going to do something like that. There wasn't even that much blood. It's not just the idea of how much does the reputation of this movie evolve past the content, but also the idea that the film is the way the film is edited and made makes you think it's more violent than it is. Like in Franklin's death scene, yeah. we cut back a lot to whether the director cuts back to um, Sally's reaction, and that makes us feel her emotion towards the scene rather than just seeing Franklin get fucking yeah. ripped in half by a chainsaw. Oh, they certainly do a lot of quick cut arounds to things too. Um, it's a more powerful way to shoot that than just showing it, especially if you can't make it look great then just don't show it. Yeah. There was a couple, like, little uh, technical, like, t at least two technical notes that I really liked. Specifically, um, in that scene, that first scene when we get him turning on the chainsaw and, like, prepare to chop the guy's arms off or whatever, head off, um, we get this really awesome cut to the windmill. It's spinning as we're still hearing the chainsaw noise. That was one of the, that, that was such a nice cut. And then I really liked in the chase scenes, although it did drag on, like the couple times they go to like these really telephoto shots facing them where it looks like he's so gigantic and he's like inches away from her even though he's like a couple yards away from her speaking of telephoto this movie uses zooms quite a bit mm. and to me when i first saw this i thought that was indicative of the budget more than anything else but upon re-watching it i realized they have quite a few dolly yes. shots in this movie Plenty. so they can afford to use a dolly it was a conscious choice to use one or the other basically and what i think that does is it gives the film kind of like you said earlier a documentary feel it makes us feel at times like this is something that was actually filmed it's not intentionally found footage but it invokes that feeling of realism like oh shit this is happening i gotta shoot it right now not yeah yeah and that's definitely true i will say i think it, like at least at some points especially at the end when it's very clear that um, they're trying to make it like sensory overload. Some of the zooms do kind of work um, to, I guess, increase just the chaos of, the, of, of certain scenes, like especially when Leatherface uh, kills Franklin, you just get this weird zoom into his face, things like that. I think some of that stuff kind of works. I think there's a couple moments where it's just like, I just don't really know why it's there, but it doesn't always you know, fall flat. I think it does work sometimes. The other thing I'd say about camera work in this movie is I really like... There's two points in this movie where they do a slow reveal of something in the house. The first moment is when the uh, horoscope girl falls into the room with the feathers and the bones, and we see slowly creeping shots throughout the room showing us the bone couch or whatever it is. Like, we're, we're totally in her headspace and her point of view of saying, like, what the fuck is that? Oh, God, it's a fucking dead guy on a couch. What the hell? And the other moment is Sally when she's at the dinner. 
she wakes up after passing out and she sees like the bones on the table and then she realizes she's still in the house it's like i didn't wake up from the nightmare i'm still here or one of my another favorite was when franklin was looking around like his dad's old house and he's like looking at the ground at that thing and then he sadly he looks up and there's this just, like hanging bone and i was like oh that was another really good one i think um the last thing i'd really like to talk about in this section is the ending of the movie because i think we're very conflicted on that um I'd like to hear your thoughts first on the ending. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to tie this into something else because I noticed in this movie a lot of how it was shot. Um, there's a lot of, like, lens flares and lights, like, aiming directly at the camera. And there's a lot of, like, very practical lights. Like, there's just lamps everywhere, and that's totally fine because it works. And there's a lot of sun. Um, although I do... I do think that aesthetically, like, the last shot of the film of just Leatherface just, like, fucking waving around the, the chainsaw looks nice. It's kind of weird. I, I think it's just, like, a very, like, out-of-place thing. I don't really know if it if it makes sense. Like, I don't I don't hate it. That's why, like, I'm not going to, like, rail on I just don't think it's just... It just doesn't really do much for me, I guess. The abrupt ending, I guess, kind of works because, like, they, they cut audio right away and they just cut the video and it's just kind of like, oh, shit. Um, I don't know. It's just kind of weird. I guess it. The only thing I have to say is like it, it ends with that same like color tone as the first shot. But other than that, it's kind of like, what the fuck's the point of that? She yeah. got away. Like end with the main character. I don't it, know. it is certainly an iconic shot. Like inarguably, probably yeah. the most famous shot of the movie. I liked it a lot more because to me, it not only reinforces the insanity of Leatherface, but to me, it's almost his character is thinking, oh fuck because the real world has seen him and they got away. And as we know from the opening crawl, in universe, this is something that got found out about. Right. So who knows what's gonna happen to Leatherface and his family after this. And I love the cut to black because in a movie where the sound is so overpowering throughout the entire thing, which we'll talk about when we talk about audio, I've got a lot to say personally, um, it's just straight cut to black. That's true. It's not only like, in a way, it's some piece, but also it's not as peaceful as a slow fade out from the audio. It is just jarring and shocking. And the lack of. And to me, it really worked. I don't want to spoil anything I was going to say for audio, but also the lack of score in that, too. It's just, just the chainsaw noise. I did like that. That was cool. There was one more thing I want to say. Okay. The thing that bugs me most about this movie, uh, this is sort of a long point here are the characters, oh. the main characters, the teenagers. They really, they don't not have personality, but they're pretty bare bones. Now to be fair, this is the movie that established the slasher genre. So there's some points you can forgive. Um, Franklin is the most defined character. And I know that Dan and I were kind of having a thought about maybe Franklin should have been the person who survived, but I just don't think that was ever going to happen based on how his character is established from the very first scene. But I really wish that Sally had been a little more um, instrumental or direct in her own actions. Yeah. Like, I don't like that it's some random guy who throws a, a pipe wrench at Leatherface to stun him. But also, that was just kind of how it was written. I, I'm, I read this really interesting book recently, I finished it, called um, Men, Women, and Chainsaws. That's all about the role of gender and sexuality in horror films. And it writes a lot about this movie. And one thing this movie established in the genre is that women are kind of powerless and that they're being chased by men and they have to be helped by men. And it wasn't until a movie like Halloween, where you have char or even Alien, which we've talked about, where you have characters like Laurie Strode or Ellen Ripley, who are the driving factor in their own salvation. Um, and I want to talk too much about those movies because you know this isn't an episode for that. Mm -hmm. But that bugs me a lot, and I'm glad to see that in later slasher movies in the genre, they address that. I, I will say this, and this is a point that I made. I think that 
I mean, in, in in slasher films, I think it's okay to have expendable characters, but like there should at least be one or two that I'm like, okay, well, I don't know if they're gonna die because I really care about them. But I think something interesting did happen when Franklin dies. At this point, we don't really have much attachment to Sally. Or really, Franklin's the sympathetic character, so it almost feels like you almost feel a little more detached from the movie after he dies because you don't really feel much attachment to Sally. But almost in a way, I think it does work in its own way that in the story, like I was saying, it almost feels lonelier, if that makes sense, just kind of like she has nobody else in the film. That's something that I kind of felt. Where It wasn't like I was so alienated. Those are, I don't care if she dies, but I was like, it felt a lot more lonely in that case. I don't know. I think it worked in its own way, but eh, you're, I, you're right. I will say two things about that. One, I think what Franklin's death where Sally lives, what that does is it makes us guessing about whether Sally will live. That's true. Because if the main, if the basically the guy who seems to be the main character dies, everything is thrown off the right. table. Anything we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. The other thing is that, to be fair to the movie, none of the main characters really have much agency at all. They don't really do much to fight back. They they either are running away or they die very quickly, and that does kind of put them in the place of like a wounded animal or, you know, livestock where they have so little power compared to the butcher. That was actually a really good conversation. Honestly, after talking about this, I, I kind of like this movie a little more. So Same. That's actually a, a pretty productive thing. But we got to talk about the sound of the film, which is the other half of it. So on to Dan. Come on, Dan. All right, guys, what's up? I'm Dan. Welcome back to the audio section for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Not Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And let there be no, no, um, no imposters. Proper distinction. It's Proper distinction. The movie. The movie. All right, so I'll be a very honest. Uh, I expected a lot more Texas in this movie, and by only saying it is in the title, I was not aware <laughs> that this movie would have been in Texas. There was not enough Texas. There was not enough, not enough chainsaw, text. and it was barely a massacre. Yeah, and 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 the reason I bring now, <laughs> so the reason I bring up the intro is because I want to talk about uh, the creepiness that was first acknowledged in this film by not only the gross and grotesque graveyard scene with the corpses, but everything that was kind of in the beginning was just creepy, screeching, scratching, kind of like. Like these yeah. industrial farm tools. equipment sound, like, you know, yeah, tools. Exactly. That, that's what I was saying with the J cut, too, in the beginning. It's just this black screen. You just get this audio that kind of uh, sets the, the, I hate the word, but sets the atmosphere. But, uh, <laughs> motherfucker wearing red sunglasses hates the word vibe. <laughs> I've never heard of that before. Uh, Your outfit I've, is a whole vibe. Yeah. vibe. And it's that, and it's, the, it's those kind of elements, especially with the... In <laughs> The whole movie being read out by, like, the first narrator of the film. I forget what his name is, and I feel bad about I, that. I, but he's not given a name. I know, I know, I don't, I don't remember his name, but I do know for a fact that he was paid with a joint to say that. <laughs> true, true <laughs> fact, true fact. You looked he, that up? That's great. Acknowledging a theme of horror, especially with this, was quite easy. Uh, plus, I kind of like the scene where, like, the huge truck, like the red one, after Franklin gets out of the car to go pee, whizzes by. And what I kind of like is that that truck sending him down the hill with just, like, the big whoosh of air sets the theme that this film is going to be pretty raw. Do, do you think that's the same truck that shows up at the end? Oh, my God. Oh, my God, dude. It's the same <laughs> fucking red truck, isn't it? Yo! So, another thing, and I kind of, yeah, th this is the next part. So, after they pick up the hitchhiker, I, I kind of like the fact that the hitchhiker is, well, in the scenes when he's talking, you can't hear him as well because the car is way too loud. I, I really like that scene a lot um, because it, it's such a almost frustrating, frustrating, frustrating scene um, because the radio music is so out of place with what the audience is feeling and what the characters are feeling. Well, what the want, characters you, are it, doing. It's like you're screaming in your head, like, this is none of this is okay. Throw him out of the car. There's He's fucking insane. Yeah, He's going to kill wrong. you. Yeah. Well, it, like, the whole time the radio's in the background playing, a, like, a catchy song, and this guy's like, oh, no. 
knife. Look at it. Hey, you want to know how I got these scars? <laughs> God damn it. it. It is sort of like, you know, you God talked about like that happy joyride music with the last episode. Yeah. Of it's totally it's unsettling. out of place with what the audience knows is going to happen. Yeah, and therefore implies that something bad is going to Well, right. then that, it's just, it, it made everything feel uncomfortably. Now, I don't know specifically if... I, I, uh, I assume to get those voices to be better, you'd have to record ADR, but if there was no ADR for that scene, whether that was an accident or not, it works perfectly. Yeah, I, I'd also making think... making the audience feel, like, <sighs> terrible. With that music thing, too, uh, I think there's something similar, too, in the ending, or not the ending, but when Sally goes into the gas station, there's that... There's a nice contrast there, too, where there's this, like, honky-tonk. Why are we saying that word all of a sudden now? Joey just said it recently. This, like, honky-tonk music playing while she's going well, to meet my room, which is kind of hilarious. But then she gets tied up, and it's like... It, you it's you just, wait here. I'll go get the truck. I, I don't know if I'd use the term honky-tonk, but I get what you're saying with that scene. I want to mention Toby Hooper because there is something I want to point out, and that is that aside from any copywritten songs used in this film... Almost no audio in this film is made with music. It's just like all like devices, things, toys, and specifically, specifically, and I made sure to write this down because I went ahead and did some searching for this. He created all the sounds with things like an African string instrument. It's like metal, and you scrape it along stuff, and it's terrifyingly like. Gross. Terrifyingly terrifying. Terrifyingly terrifying if you yeah. want it to be like that. But it, it's gross to the ears and it scrunches you up. It's just very big There's a lot of grinding sounds. Yeah, there's a lot of grinding sounds. I, I like a lot of moments in this film where they do Ow. use sound to kind of over, overwhelm you. Like, I think the first time I would, uh, that I thought about that was the, uh, aside from the intro, the slaughterhouse yeah. scene where we see the cows and we're put in like up close with the cows and we just hear their mooing and there's also rising sound to the music at that point too before it cuts away um but Suspense. when yeah when Huge. sally is screaming her head off in the dinner scene it, it's like you want to cover your ears like it really oh. puts you in that situation of just stop mm. fucking yelling jesus christ i want to get the hell out of here and i made a joke about that about how i how much you want to bet that in her script for the rest of the film after her mouth got ragged that it was just like muff like yes right here muffled screaming that's all that's right. written well i mean aside for the fact that she was like you know at least 10 lines for the rest of the movie yeah but i'm surprised her vocal cords didn't give out there yeah Maybe that, they did there was another moment too movie like when, magic guys when movie she magic. was running away from leatherface and went back in the house and she ran upstairs and she saw like the corpse of of the grandpa and that other corpse, corpse. yeah whatever. corpse the corpse of the lady and then the very well done makeup of the, we thought it was a corpse. Of, it was um, a husk. Yeah, um, you got like as soon as you get like the close up shots of their faces, you get those like those bell sounds or uh, bell's a horrible way to describe it. It's almost like an alarm sound. It's like it's like really fuck that kind of stuff. Really amplified that. Oh yeah, that no, uh, and I <laughs> specifically aside from the African string instrument, which was made of metal, like he also used stuff such as like a cardboard tube and a pitchfork. I love metal which, music. Which, uh, <laughs> which he quotes is, well, uh, which he quotes produced the nerve-wracking zinging sounds that, yeah, it's by sliding it along hard surfaces, which, you know, is kind of what the movie wants if it's going to be portraying the whole holy yeah. crap these guys it's, are insane it's almost like the flip side of what i was saying with production design where you get this like this visual environment of of the butcher and of these characters of slaughterhouse and these characters and then on the audio side you sort of have that too mm -hmm. i think that's kind of how it works i kind of uh and this is a, this is just like a side thought i had right now the uh, what the the girl when she runs into the house the first girl not Sally yeah uh, and falls into the room full of, like bones and feathers and stuff like that there's a lot of rising tension in there as well and what I like about this and this is more of a video element but as that suspense is building the killer doesn't immediately come in or is not introduced to her but yeah. rather it gives her time to try and run away and then <sighs> the killer's like right there he 
I, I kind of thought as well, like, I don't know if you guys thought this when she was, like, falling over and started, like, throwing up from how gross the room was and how much suspense was being built up, like, chicken in the cage making chicken sounds and cage yeah. sounds, which are, you know, other elements that are maybe heard inside of a slaughterhouse, as that was the whole point behind all the sound design of the film. I was kind of wondering if the killer was going to show up even at all and that, like, maybe she'd just run out of the house traumatized and... Not, not to say that this was going to happen at all, because it's a very far-fetched idea, but in other films, very insane elements like that have driven to... have driven people to kill themselves from how insane it is. Uh, I, don't wanna, I can see what I, you're saying. I, I don't want to bring up The Empty Man, but seeing that effigy in the beginning of that film and how it like took control of the person and they killed themselves from how insane it was, I just kind of thought about that. Yeah, I I don't remember if it was that first girl, but I remember in at least one of the times he, he grabbed somebody. I think it might have been her. Or was it the other guy? I can't remember. <laughs> but there's just like all this this chaos going on, and then he slams the door, and pff, yeah. that's it. That, I think that's when he kills. That was the off. first guy. Yeah, the first dude. When he when he after he spun on the ground, he dragged him, and the sliding metal door yeah. closes. That is a great scene. I will say, just because I was a little disappointed in this, but, you know, it, it, it budget might not have allowed it or no one might have cared. Uh, putting the putting the first girl on the skin hooks, I wish that would have made a sound, like a, a fleshy, stabby sound, because it does not sound, like, when that happened, I get you're trying to, like, pull yourself off it, like, yes, you are probably stabbed in the back, more towards the shoulder, but I wish that would have made, like, even, like, a bone, like a... To at least give the audience a very clear picture that, yeah, she is pretty much stabbed and not, like, just hung well, out that, the shoulder. That kind of goes along, too, with the fact that there's not even a lot of visual gore. No, yeah. I, I and think it's there's, if there's n- And thing. if there's not a lot of visual gore, then I really didn't expect there to be a lot of audio yeah. gore. I think the only real note I That's had what I call it. about audio is I really liked how, um, especially in the chase scene, where... It's not totally true because there's some sound elements, but basically the chainsaw, the motor becomes like the soundtrack essentially for like that entire chase. Um, With and he, Sally in the Woods. Right. And even yeah. before that, like when the generator is just randomly running, it's kind of, that's almost, I don't want to say like the, the precursor is the wrong word, but it's kind of like. It a, is kind of like a foreboding element to it like it gets this sign mm-hmm. to the audience and puts the idea of the chainsaw in our head. Right. Whereas the obviously the. um. The, the teenagers here have no idea right. what awaits them in the Sawyer household. Yeah. And that brings me to, like, more of the noises you hear around the house or when all the people are getting killed. And they have a lot of, like, offset delay and EQ applied to them, making higher frequencies a lot, like, pitched up or using, like, three delays at once. So it's like you could get something, like, instead of just do, to do, 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 something like that. And especially pitching up high frequency stuff is like screeching to the ears because there is a point in which sound that is either too loud or too high will reach what's called the threshold of pain. And yeah. anything that passes that, like a, you stand in front of a jet engine on like an airplane that just takes off, that's going to break your threshold of pain, will physically cause you harm. And I think like while it wasn't obviously going to do that with TV speakers, All right. like I, that's what the movie's trying to pull off, in my opinion. Audio for it's, video, what's that number? How many decibels is that? What did Hamrock say? Like the eight, threshold, the or threshold of pain. Yeah. I'll, I'll say my final point is that the point of that tactic was not just to emulate what's like the actual slaughterhouse theme to it, but to have higher frequency peaks that are what's known as bisensorial. And it affects both ear and skin. In other words, hmm. sound that makes your skin crawl is essentially what's called bisensorial sound. That's fascinating. Th- this is a movie that really, if it did not have the amount of attention put into its audio, would not be as good. And that's very evident based on our conversation. Absolutely. Here. And well, and the lack of gore. Yeah, definitely. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't have been able to feel the scary element without most of the sounds. Well. Honestly, if you really want a great horror experience, now that you've heard me talk about this film, go watch it yourself. In fact, I'm not even going to watch it again. It was that creepy. You're just going to have to see what it sounds like for yourself. And uh, maybe then I'll finally get the courage to buy more ice cream. Thanks for coming on. All right, we're back from audio, and it's time to discuss our lesson from the film. 
I think my lesson isn't the most specific thing as it has been for other movies, but this is something I just genuinely liked, and I mentioned it before. I think the attention to detail in production design and, and costumes, which, as you said, which is also a part of production design, was really, really well done in this movie. Um, you know, obviously they had a budget. I think it was like 130, 140 thousand or something, um, and you know they clearly put a lot of effort into the look of, I, I don't want to say like the villain's lair, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, his, his environment, his surroundings for Leatherface, uh, I think it's, you know, a character's environment is very important to them, like their, their wardrobe and their environment and their setting says a lot about them as just people. Um, and I think, you know, things like, you know, the couch made of bones and shit like that, or the heads hanging on the wall, uh, all of that stuff, and, and obviously in the dinner scene, we see a, a little bit more of the house, even things like the hand lamp and stuff like that. There's a lot of really awesome uh, details that it shows that it's not just like, oh, it's just a shitty low-budget exploitation film that they threw together. There was clearly, it, it does reek of that in some ways, but I think there was clearly effort to put in put into it um, to try to make it something more than that, and I really appreciated that. That's a great takeaway from this movie. Um, we've talked about that a fair bit before with um, a lot of sci-fi, but this is a different angle to speculative fiction that um, we haven't talked about yet. My takeaway from this movie is how you can overwhelm an audience with, I'd say mainly sound, but also visuals and your story. Because this movie, throughout all of it, we talked about this with our, with our audio section a bit, um, is... The, the the audio is so oppressive. The soundtrack is industrial. It's like farm equipment. It's scraping. It's grinding. It's it's buzzing. It's like the, it's reminiscent of the very chainsaw that Leatherface uses throughout the movie. At some points, like in the chase scenes, that's all you hear. But also the screaming from Sally, especially in the dinner scene, how almost frustrating and to some people upsetting that is because you just want her to shut up. It's like when an animal is screaming at you. It, it, you want it to be quiet, but it refuses to. There's also moments with, like, the overexposed windows in the van. To me, that adds to the um, to, to the overwhelming aspect of this film. And I think that's where the real horror of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is. It's not just the situation. It's how the situation is presented. Yeah, so... I I had I wrote a little note down for, kind of related to this. I basically said this film is to the eye as noise rock is to the ears, basically. It's just kind of hectic because it needs to be hectic or because they want it to be hectic. And there's nothing wrong with that because it's effective. So. The movie is almost headache inducing. Um, and I that 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 is absolutely the point. So because of that, the movie's not gonna be for everyone. No. But I really enjoyed it. Yeah, in a weird way. Hi, welcome to The Kill Count. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're talking at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, released in 1974. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched this movie before, telling by what I just said. So, I have compiled some of my funny notes and what I've thought happened, because I did not watch the movie twice and now they these guys have to guess um where this funny note came from which movie this came from where i wrote it down anyway i only have two notes for this just original ones the title of course which is the uh, redneck anti-gum movie dot mov <laughs> <laughs> and also why i i i just i'm still wrapping my head around why so much cannibalism so much f cannibalism. I am not happy with you. Dumb looking car. Ding. I got it! Free souvenir. Oh, fuck me. Wait. Terminator. Yep. I will tell you this. There's no season one notes. Wow, oh, okay. And slacker. Well, because you lost them. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I gotta love slash hate the hot stud. American Psycho. No. Fuck! Scorn, you're out. Damn it! Y'all get one guess. Wait, is this also Terminator? No. No. I, I hey, Dan, you, you gotta guess. That's my point. This is also Clockwork Orange. Orange. Fuck off! 
Whoever says it first he gets it. Soda! American Psycho. <laughs> yeah, thank you, ah! <laughs> He got just a bit too frisky. Clockwork Orange again? Nope. Damn it. Heavy traffic. Yeah. Fuck. One wheelie boy. Schlock. No. Oh, um. A simple plan. Nope. Fuck. I think, dude, Cor do I still have a guess? You get a guess because you're just um, dumb. Uh, Andre Rublev. Nope, that's a point for me. That is Terminator. Ragdoll girl. Oh. Oh no, is this Clockwork Orange? It is. Blood spread good on the back. Inhuman, which. No. I only wrote six notes for that. <laughs> American Psycho? Nope. Uh, Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> nope. I know it's not. My point. Buster Scruggs. Oh, I forgot about that fucking movie. I like to freeze Daddy Captain. Dark Star. There you go. Upsy Daisy. Oh, that's Buster Scruggs. Nope. I'm gonna go with Andre Rublev again. Right. What? <laughs> Grilled Juicy Metal. Terminator. No. Fuck. Uh, Speed. No. Uh, Requiem for a Dream. Correct. Really? Oh. Let's go. Is it cake? American Psycho. Yep. <laughs> People hate modern art. Um, Andre Rublev. Yep. I thought about that for a second. Like I was like, oh. Party at Grandma's. Ooh, um, uh, mm, uh. Oh, I, I know it. I feel like that's also oh. Requiem for a Dream. No. Dan got it first. No! Oh, I was gonna guess. I was gonna guess Clock of Orange again. No, no you got it first. Uh, I... Baby's first meal. Is that a clockwork orange? Nope. Damn. Um, I thought of the the milk fountain. You know what I'm talking about. Babe. Oh, that's Rock Green for a Dream. Yep. Will Corwin get this one right? Or will Dan get this one right? I don't like the way my skin feels on my body. Silence of the Lambs. No. What? No. Oh, god damn it. I know which one it is. Fuck. I don't Can like I guess the... again? No. Fuck you. You guessed. You, you, you were too quick to the Fuck draw. Fuck you. Hmm, what's a film where someone's skin Shut. completely comes off their Shut body? Shut up, it, Ryan. No, give it to Ryan. I don't remember. I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> their skin completely burns off their body. Can I say it and get half a point? No. Damn it. Dan, come on. No, Dan. You Ryan. know this. Ryan's right? giving you this point. <laughs> He literally just described Can it. we get a Dan is fucking dumb? Can we get a Dan moment? Yes. Everyone comment Dan moment. Terminator. It's fucking Terminator. Joey gets the point. I get the point because Ryan is just pitying me. <laughs> the final one. Men are weak. Hashtag girl boss. Silence of the Lambs? No. That's Terminator. No. Fuck. Okay, Dan. It's all you, man. Dan, it's all you. Say it again. Men are weak. Hashtag girl boss. I feel like that's heavy traffic. No. Nope. It's American Psycho. It's Andre Rublev. Really? What? It is. Yes, it is. I said that at the end of Andre Rublev. Ryan wins with six. Joey second with five. <laughs> On default, because we suck. Because we suck. with four, and Dan with two. Woo! I like that two of mine were Andre Rublev. Anyway, that's been funny notes. Uh, I'm at the end now, so I don't, I don't really have an out. What's next? Our next movie. Well... We are, we're wrapping up October with this, so we're getting into November, and we've got a, a little bit of a thematic thing planned with our next movie. As we did for um, Halloween. I think probably most people are not going to see it coming because it's not generally the, uh, the holiday you think of in America with November, but especially if you're familiar with Europe, you're going to... I think you're going to enjoy this next one. We're doing a Thanksgiving movie, guys. No, I'm Definitely kidding. Thanksgiving. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, and I think I've had enough of, um, you know, horror slasher movies for now. So, because we crammed them all into the beginning. So, um, until then, make sure to watch the rest of the videos this season. Like and subscribe. And it helps us out a lot. It does, certainly. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, folks.